Good evening, beloved. Peace be with you. Tonight I thought we could just continue. Um, a little review, a little continue, moving on. Can, focusing again on the, um, the theme we've been talking about with that is of encounter, creating encounters for people to um, meet the risen Christ. <clears throat> so or, or creating an atmosphere of encounter for the risen Christ. And um, we, we mentioned last time why this works, um, how it's a lot of times we can talk with people about this, that, or the other teaching of the church and why it's good or, or you know, different challenges among different teachings sometimes. But the real conversion and change and transformation of the heart that happens is when the person actually encounters Christ, the risen Christ, in a powerful way. And we mentioned St. Paul's conversion story as an example. And then this morning we had St. Paul, Paul's conversion story in our first reading at the Acts of the Apostles. So I thought we could look at that and just continue to comment a little bit um, more on encounter. But also uh, move on. So that's in Acts chapter 9. And then also give a little um, example again of just creating an, creating atmospheres of encounter with the risen Christ um, in chapter 10 when Peter, um, when Cornelius has the vision that, hey, call this man named Peter down here to speak to you guys. And so then Peter has a vision too that he's supposed to go down to talk to this, the, these people from Joppa or from Cornelius. And so Peter goes down there and begins this speech and they all have such a powerful encounter with God that the Holy Spirit falls on them. The Holy Spirit of Jesus falls on them. And so looking at, at some of, there's a lot of different cool little insights we can pull out as disciples uh, on, on in creating an atmosphere of encounter. Because that's where we want to go as part of our, our job as disciples to, um, so that uh, it, an atmosphere of encounter is like an instinct. <laughs> it becomes like breathing for us. That we are just are, we're, we have an atmosphere of encounter around us, or the presence of God around us. So that when people encounter us, they encounter the presence of God. You know, and that begins to already soften and change and transform their hearts. But at first, it may take a little work, as we're learning to develop some of these habits of disciples and learning to put into practice some very practical things we can do to build up and, and foster an atmosphere of encounter with Christ. So let's look at, um, so just a quick review again, some things, practical ways we looked at. How do we build up and foster an atmosphere of encounter with the risen Christ? And we looked at practical things we do. First is always prayer, you know, prayer. As we, anytime we pray, we're talking to God. And so, ta-da, God's there. <laughs> God's present. And so if we're praying, um, not, now if we're praying with someone, all of a sudden God's there with us, with that person. If we're praying for that person, it's almost like we're introducing that person or putting them into a, a contact or an encounter with the risen Christ. And who knows what they'll experience. You know, that's between them and God. But we just know when we begin to pray with someone and for someone, God is present there and, we are, and they will encounter him. How they respond is up to them, you know. So prayer for, for sure is the number one guaranteed way. Anytime we talk to God, God's present. As we... Um, and anytime we talk about God, God is present. God is present. So, <clears throat> so anytime we're speaking about God to a friend, sharing our testimony about what God's done in our life with a friend, God is present. Anytime we're, we're reading the scriptures out loud, here comes God. God is present. Uh, <clears throat> okay, we'll get into more of those when we look at chapter 10. Uh, we looked at praise and worship, guaranteed way to foster an encounter with, with God, with uh, the crucified and risen Jesus Christ. As soon as you and I start praising God or worshiping him or both, here comes God. He loves it. He's like drawn to it like a magnet. So his presence comes and begins to manifest itself more and more fully or thick or tangibly in that place as we just experienced you know, some of, the, some of the songs and words we use were worship. I give myself to you, Lord. I live myself for you. I love you, Lord. Some of the songs, some of the words we sang were praise. 
God, how amazing you are, how wonderful you are, how beautiful you are. And the more we start praising, complimenting, blessing, adoring God, God likes it, you know, he says, tell me more. <laughs> and anytime we praise and worship God, it draws the praise and worship angels of God to that place. And, and, and they, begin to, they begin to dance and to sing and to change the atmosphere around us. And so, hence, the presence of God also is increasing in that place. And it's all fostering. You know, play, typically, you ever been to um, an old monastery or convent where there's been religious people there who were good religious and they, were, they, they really lived their vows fully and they prayed that place up <laughs> and you can walk into that place and you can feel the presence of god there as soon as you walk into that place it changes everything or you go on retreat somewhere where it's a place that is dedicated for retreat and encounter with god and there's and prayer and silence and just going there you can feel the difference that's because they've been praying up that physical location and it's the consecration there is growing. The presence of God there in a sense is growing, increasing. Why? Because it's been, there's been people feeding, fostering, nourishing, watering that presence of God there. So it grows. Same thing can happen in our homes, in our room, in our church, hopefully, in our lives, right? Because our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit of God. And so just, you, I, I remember being in a place uh, when I was a new Catholic, and there was a priest there who was coming who was known for a lot of different charismatic gifts. And, um, and, uh, and um, we were there praying, waiting. He was late. And I remember there was a moment where I felt the atmosphere in the room shift. And then about 30 seconds later, my friend who had invited me comes over and says, Father, finally got here. I said, I know. I could feel it. You know, this presence of God, the anointing of God around him. And in that place, oh, I'm already going to chapter 10, what I was going to say. When people are in a place waiting and expecting, just that waiting, that expectation creates an encounter for God. And so the people, all of us, they're waiting to encounter God and to, to enter into this worship service and then waiting for this, this man of God that, who, who was anointed with these different um, gifts of prayer. It changed the atmosphere. So that can happen in our lives. You, know, you and I, the more we foster this and feed this in our lives, can become this, this uh, Imagine it, you're walking, and as you're walking, you're shifting the atmosphere around you with the presence of God, you know. That's part of what was happening to Peter at some point, right, as he was walking, just his shadow comes over, and, and, and healing is happening in people's lives, you know. It's not beyond any of us, you know. We, these are things that we can practically do, feed, foster, and increase the presence of God in our lives. Prayer, scripture reading, talking about Jesus, blessing Jesus, adoring Jesus, praising Jesus, praying to God every day, all day. As St. Paul said, praying without ceasing. So these are the practical things. That's review. We talked about those things to help create, foster, and increase an atmosphere of encounter in our lives, in a place, in a life. <clears throat> so let's just... Uh, Oh, forget it. We're going to skip Saul. Oh, we'll just read it because it's fun. We're creating an atmosphere of encounter. Here we go, Lord. In case you weren't at Mass this morning. This is Acts chapter 9. Powerful thing here. Remember, now Paul, Saul, Saul, Paul, Saul, Paul, he was um, the best of Pharisees, Pharisee of Pharisees, and he knew the law to the letter of the law better than any other Pharisees, probably better than that high priest that he walks up to today. And he, he was the best Pharisee. He was the best he knew everything the best. He could debate anybody and everybody and prove that, what, that he was right. Uh, in fact, he could prove uh, through the scriptures, through the tradition of the Jews, that Jesus was not the Messiah. And so he proved it to his other Pharisee brothers, to the high priest, so much so he got permission to go and arrest Christians and then kill them. Uh, 
So that's where, Je that's where Saul is. And then, so nobody can convince him otherwise. You can't have debates with him, doctrinal debates about him. Let's talk about the scriptures. Let's go back and forth. Let's talk about the tradition. No, you can't win with him. He's the best. <laughs> He's the best one. So he has, he has it so, his argumentation so strong that he is justified to kill believers in Jesus and it is justified in the scriptures and in the tradition as he interprets it. And nobody's better than, nobody can out-interpret him. So nothing can change his mind. Something needs to change his heart. Uh, this always should give us hope when we see the, the craziest person out there, you know. Okay, God, I guess you're the one you want to go get, right? And so here's Paul. Now, he, now Luke summarizes it. Now Saul was still breathing murderous threats against the disciples of the Lord and went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus that if anyone should find any men or women who belonged to the way, the way, the way of life that Jesus taught that leads us to eternal life. If anyone who belonged to the way, he might bring them back to Jerusalem in chains. On his journey, as he was nearing Damascus, a light from the sky suddenly flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you, sir? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, for they heard the voice but could see no one. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. For three days he was unable to see, and he neither ate nor drank. There was a disciple in Damascus, named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight and ask, the, ask at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is there praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him and that he may regain his sight. But Ananias replied, Lord, I have heard from many sources about this man, what evil things he has done to your holy ones in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to imprison all who call upon your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for this man is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. And I will show him what he will have to suffer for my name. So Ananias went and entered the house, laying his hands on him. He said, Saul, my brother, the Lord sent me, Jesus, who appeared to you on the way by which you came, that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, things like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. He got up and was baptized, and when he had eaten, he recovered his strength. He stayed some days with the disciples in Damascus, and he began, to, he began at once to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. All who heard him were astounded and said, is not this the man who in Jerusalem ravaged those who call upon his name and came here expressly to take them back in chains to the chief priests? But Saul grew all the stronger and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Messiah. What? Talk about a total change. The change of heart changed his mind. 
Before this, nothing could change his mind because nothing was changing his heart. But that encounter with the risen Christ changed his heart and changed his mind. Now he was not running around proving that Jesus is not the Messiah. Now he's running around proving that he is the Messiah. And the biggest proof of all we know, of course, is his life change. It's the, wait, isn't this the one that was coming to kill us? Now he's preaching better than us. So this is just always a good example for us to remember the power of, the, of encounter, the power of the ministry of encounter with the risen Lord and why it's so important to you know, ask ourselves sometimes, what are we doing that's um, creating, feeding, and fostering an atmosphere of encounter for the risen Lord? How are we praying up? our house, our home, our workplace, our church? How are we praising up our church, our workplace, our house, our home, our lives, our body as the temple of the risen, of the, the risen Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit? Okay, fast forward. Let's try to, I'll try to comment. I already messed it all up. Chapter 10, Acts of the Apostles. We know the story we already said. Cornelius, God-fearing person, God-fearing household, and God-fearing friends, um, was praying and showed a vision to call in a man, send for a man named Peter. And so he does, and at the same time, Peter also has a vision that this, he's going to be called on, and he's supposed to go to these Gentile God-fearing house. And he does, and, and so um, and at the end here, here's chapter 10, verse 33, Cornelius is finishing off telling Peter why he called uh, and telling about the vision that he had. So I sent for you immediately, and you were kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to listen to all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So we can pause right there, like we already said. How, what's another way of creating an atmosphere of encounter? They're all here gathered in the presence of God. The presence of God is there. Why? Because they gathered, expecting, waiting to encounter God. And the words of God, the truth of God, is going to be spoken through Peter. They don't know what's going to happen. They don't know the Holy Spirit's going to come down upon them. They don't know. They just know, here comes God. We're going to encounter God. When this man, Peter, comes and speaks to us. So anytime we are gathering for the purpose of encountering God, meeting God, when we're expecting God to show up, God shows up. God's there. We fought just the expectation, the showing up, it feeds an atmosphere of encounter with God. I always joke with poor VJ. She thinks I'm crazy. I walk over, I say, Good job, VJ. She goes, what did I do? I say, you showed up. First step. Yeah. You could have not showed up. Yeah, then Amy's not going to show up. Then it's up to us to sing. What are we going to do? But you showed up. First step to show up. And when we show up, God's there. God also shows up. So there they are. They say, well, here we are. We're in the presence of God to listen to all that you have been commanded by the Lord to say. So the, other, the next thing is they're there waiting, listening, and Peter's about to speak. So, and then, so here we see. This is a good, a, a good one for, just to read a couple times, get down this, like a good summary of the, of the ministry of Jesus, of the life of Jesus that Peter says. And every time somebody says, hey, tell me about Jesus. Okay, let me tell you about Jesus. I'll tell you what Peter said about Jesus too. And, and you, can, you and I can add to it according to our encounters with Jesus too. Peter, his speech, chapter 10, verse 34, then Peter proceeded to speak. And we see, we'll see in the speaking of Jesus, of Jesus' life and his ministry and his truth, the speaking, the speaking of the good news of Jesus Christ uh, brings an encounter with the Holy Spirit of Christ. So Peter says, in truth, I see that God shows no partiality. 
Rather, in every nation, whoever fears him and acts uprightly is acceptable to him. You know the word that he sent to the Israelites as he proclaimed peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all, what has happened all over Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, right? That was when the beginning of the public ministry of Jesus. And Peter continues, how, you know how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. Now, do you remember when that happened? The Catholic pop quiz. Come on, you guys. When was Jesus anointed by the Holy Spirit? Baptism. Baptism. When was he when was he anointed with power? After the baptism, keep going. What happened right after the baptism? Yeah, so, so he's anointed by the Spirit after the baptism when the Holy Spirit comes down on him in the form of a dove. But now what about the power? Yeah, Peggy knows she's ruining it. Then, remember it says, then the Spirit drove him into the wilderness for 40 days where he was fasted and praised and with the wild animals. And the devil came to tempt him and he resisted the devil faithfully for those 40 days, especially those, those last three temptations that we hear of. And then it says, when, when he finished that faithfully, the devil left him for a more opportune time. And it says, then he came out of the desert in power. Oh, you want your faith to be empowered. You need some prayer, some fasting, some resisting of the devil. That's why God lets the devil come and bug us sometimes. He wants us to get powered up with the Holy Spirit. Now Jesus is ready for public ministry. He's got the Spirit and power. And so he did. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. And they put him to death by hanging him on a tree. This man, though, God raised on the third day and granted that he be visible not to all the people, but to us, the witnesses chosen by God in advance, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commissioned us to preach. So uh, he ate and drank with us after he rose from the dead. Give me some examples. Let's go. We've been hearing them. When did he eat with them after rising from the dead? Anybody go to the Mass last Sunday? Remember, he ate a piece of baked fish to show them he's not a ghost, right? Now, and if you know John, the end of John, he appears to them on the shore of Galilee, and when they're fishing, helps them catch fish, they drag it in, and when they get on the shore, they see he's already got a fire started, and he says, bring some of the fish that you brought, and he eats with them again. So different times, he ate and drank with them. We have to test you guys. He commissioned that, he, Peter says, he commissioned us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him, this is the good news right here, that everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness of sins through his name. Poor Peter, this is a short homily for Peter. He's just getting warmed up, you know. And we said, while Peter's still speaking, these things, the Holy Spirit falls upon all who are listening to the word. Okay, so those who are listening to the word get an, can have an encounter with the Holy Spirit of Jesus. So we're gathered. We're ready, we're feeding an atmosphere of encounter. We're ex- expecting God, we're feeding an atmosphere of encounter. We're listening, we're, expect, we're, we're feeding and fostering an atmosphere of encounter with the risen Christ and his Holy Spirit. Peter speaking, 
the truth about Jesus. So he's feeding, fostering an encounter with the risen Jesus and the, and the Holy Spirit of, of Jesus. And here comes the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the word. The circumcised believers who had accompanied Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit should have been poured out on the Gentiles also, for they could hear them speaking in tongues and glorifying God, having an encounter with God. <laughs> Powerful. So, you know, so keep, if we keep it practical, what are the ways you and I are already are already feeding and fostering an atmosphere of encounter in our lives, in our homes, in our rooms, or some room? You know how we in our workplace, if we have to go to work, how are we fostering a, an encounter with the risen Lord there, shifting the atmosphere even there? How are we feeding and fostering, building up an atmosphere of encounter with our very lives, our bodies? Uh, so that just as we move through a place, the presence of God is also moving through a place and shifting the atmosphere around us. You know, so gosh, if, if you and I, if the presence of God would grow in, in, in our lives so powerful that when you and I entered a room, the whole atmosphere in the room would shift and people would just look at you. Yeah. What are you looking at me for? It's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you never met the Holy Spirit? Let me pray for you. Put you in encounter right now, the Holy Spirit, you right? So these are some of the goals that we're working up to as disciples. And just as we keep feeding and fostering, as we said last time, God will do the growing. We're feeding, fostering, we're planting, watering. God will do the growing of the Holy Spirit of God, the presence of God in our lives. So how are you and I already consciously uh, feeding, fostering, planting, watering the, these, these uh, opportunities for encounter. Uh, and how can we do that more or do that better? You know, this is the, the best way. Sometimes we all know friends or family members who have gone away from, the, from um, don't follow Christ anymore. Um, and, and, you know, we wonder, should I say this? Should I say that? How do I get their attention again? How do I let them, especially parents, like, ask, always ask the question, you know, my kids aren't practicing the faith. How, what should I say to them? How do I, you know, when do I know what to say, how to say, what to say? And the best thing, really, is just to back off and start f pouring the energy into feeding the atmosphere of encounter. And as they encounter the presence of God more and more, pretty soon one day, then they'll start to ask, <laughs> And then that's the best time to speak because then we know their hearts have been prepared and ready, open, the, the, this encounter of the, with the presence of God that's been soaking in, their, in the soaking in the soil of their heart. Now their hearts are soft and ready for the, the seed of the word of God to be planted and the truth of the word of God to be planted in their life. So, you know, when somebody's not too hard-hearted or whatever, just won't listen, okay, fine, I'm going to sneak attack you with the encounter, you know, with the risen Lord. I'm going to be able to change the atmosphere around you. You're not going to see it coming. All of a sudden, you'll just be swimming in it, you know. That's the best thing for us to do. Uh, and, and, and that is, again, that's how we're going to change hearts. And by changing hearts, when the heart changes, the mind automatically will change. The mind automatically changes. Uh, all in steps, all in process, all in growth. But what are some things you and I can do? You know, do we read the word of God every day? And when you read the word of God, we said a long time in the past, read it out loud, you know? Because, you know, people say a lot of bad things out loud all the time. Why not say some good things out loud? Because it does shift the atmosphere. What we say, blessings or curses, changes the atmosphere. So when we read the word of God and we read it out loud, it shifts the atmosphere and helps really kind of water that room with the word of God. That's another reason why monasteries and convents and these retreat houses are so, so kind of soaked in the presence of God or the anointing of God because usually the monks and the nuns are singing or chanting the Psalms and the scriptures. They're, it's all out loud, soaking, soaking, soaking in the atmosphere and the environment. 
So do we read the word of God every day, even a little bit, for a couple of minutes, and do we read it out loud, you know, shifting the atmosphere? Do we have that, that consistent time every day where we're, we're, we're dedicated to prayer with God, where it's one-on-one, not prayer while I'm doing something else, not prayer while I'm walking, not prayer while I'm driving, not prayer while I'm doing something else, not prayer while I'm washing the dishes. Those are all good things to keep practicing, but one-on-one where I'm just staring at my lover in his eyes, face-to-face. It's just me and you, Lord. Just dedicate even a couple minutes of that this powerful time, that dedicated prayer. That's probably the times that why Ananias was able to hear when God spoke and said, Ananias, probably because he was already listening. Yes, Lord. <laughs> Notice he recognized God's voice right away. Yes, Lord, here I am. I have a wonderful task for you, Ananias. <laughs> Go ask somebody else, Lord. <laughs> and praise and worship, we talked about already. You know, how often do we, do we sing praises or worship God? Or do we have the, the music in the background of praise and worship? Just soaking again the atmosphere, the air, soaking the car, soaking the room. It shifts and it changes things. We know music changes things, you know. We have a two-year-old preschool classroom underneath that side chapel there. And, you know, two-year-olds, huh? Tough. They can be tough, loud, noisy. They can be stubborn. They can be beautiful and cute. They can be wild. And I walked down there the other day. And the, the teacher was so smart, she put on this nice, soft music in the background. Oh, man, they were calm, you know? They were like angels. They were like angels. Ooh, perfect. I said, what happened here? It's never been like this before. Oh, yeah, put the music on now. <laughs> you know, so even people saw you know, different praise and worship music. It just began to change the atmosphere in, in the home, in the house. You can, it can, the God's presence can get so thick in a place that when you enter that place, it's like walking through a wall of the Holy Spirit. And it will kind of filter off all the junk. <laughs> and keep that at the door while you enter into God's presence. And that's really the safe place. You know, if the world gets crazy, that's always the place that's going to be safe for us, is that presence of God. That's going to be our refuge, our safe place, our shelter in the storm. And so we want to be able to to be feeding that and fostering that and building it up in our lives now, having those safe, dedicated places of refuge where this is the, this is the place where I go, where dedicated God's presence is here. I know it. And that doesn't have to be the church only. It can be our homes, our rooms, our car. It can be a little prayer room, a prayer chair sometimes. But and ideally, we want to get that to where it's, it's, it's our bodies, it's our lives, it's this temple is that dedicated place of, of encounter with Christ uh, where the presence of God is so thick, you know. You may walk up to somebody, say hi, shake their hand, and they get slain in the Holy Spirit right there in front of you. <laughs> the, Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit just gets them, zap them. Yeah, these things can happen, you know. But it does take our job planting the seed, nourishing the soil, watering it, with our prayer, praise, worship, reading the word of God out loud, talking about God, and blessing God, praising God, adoring God. You know, every day tell God how, what a good job he did that day, you know, or something. He did a good job, you know. You know, you get, you get, you get, never mind, I won't go there. Let's pray, we're going to just pray right now. Lord, we thank you so much for all you're doing in our lives and for continuing to be present to us and, and encounter us more and more in a deeper ways every day. We just pray you would um, uh, send your Holy Spirit into our lives, each one of us here in a fresh new way, and show us, Lord, how each one of us in our, with our lives, uh, with all that you're doing in our lives, how we can take the next step towards fostering um, a, a, fostering and feeding and growing an atmosphere of encounter in our individual lives so that not only we will encounter you uh, more often and more deeply or more personally, more intimately, but those around us, those who, who come around us will also have an encounter with you. Um, so teach us, Lord, how you want each one of us to do that, to take that next step, whether it's through prayer or praise or worship or reading the word of God out loud, or, or speaking about you um, out loud, uh, blessing you, praising you, adoring you, 
show us, Lord. Maybe it's showing up. Maybe it's us showing up you know, just to be present with you uh, in a place. Uh, and, and, or maybe you just want to grow and increase our expectation that you are going to do something mighty and powerful in our lives. We pray you to help us feed and foster all those things, but especially show each one of us tonight at least one of those areas in our life that you want to touch and grow so that we can have deeper, more intimate encounters with you. We just pray all these things together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.